السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering and bless this community and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from all kinds of harm Ameen Welcome to another episode from Dean Talks and uh, this series that we're talking about uh, our community's involvement in politics especially that we are approaching the elections so this is a series of talks that tells us or informs us or enlightens us about the uh, importance of us being involved whether to be registered to vote or to vote or be part of the political process or the political system in our country here in the USA uh, we are very honored to be to have with us uh, the first elected uh, Muslim assembly member of the uh, Assembly of the State of California, uh, Attorney Bill Asaley, uh, who uh, represents the district number 63. 63, which is the city of Corona, Norco, some part of the Inland Empire. And uh, he is uh, a rising star among the politicians. People are talking about him. I was actually attending uh, a small fundraising a few weeks ago. And uh, this is a, a, a mainstream, not, not from our community. And everyone's talking about Bill and about the uh, amazing work that he's doing on the Capitol Hill. Uh, we are pleased to have you and we'd like to start by knowing a little bit more about you. Yeah. Bill, give us a little bit uh, about uh, some information about yourself, your ID card. <laughs> Who is Bill Asali? Well, my social is... No, <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's uh, always good when you can have a long conversation. So much of what we do is, you know, 30 second sound bites. So it's good to have a long conversation. Um, as he said, I come from uh, Corona. I grew up in Corona. My parents both immigrated from Lebanon in the 80s. Me and my sisters were born here. Uh, grew up in a very uh, tight knit community. Uh, family values, the whole thing. My family's very big. My dad's a family of 12 brothers and sisters. My mom's seven. So we had a lot of cousins growing up. Um, my parents did not go to college, so I was the first uh, in my family to go to college. I went to Cal Poly Pomona, got my political science degree. I uh, then went to Chapman Law School, got my law degree. Um, out of law school, I went to Paul Hastings, worked in a big law firm, doing civil practice for a few years. And then I did what my real passion was, which was being a prosecutor. So. After that, I went to the Riverside District Attorney's Office, um, where I prosecuted all kinds of cases um, there from the community. And after about four years, I moved over to the federal side and was at the U.S. Attorney's Office um, until I stepped down to run uh, for, for State Assembly. All right. yeah. When did you run for the State Assembly? So I actually, the first time I ran was in 2018. Um, it was a very competitive race. Uh, it was the registration is very close between Republican and Democrats, and um, and if they haven't, if they don't know yet, I'm a Republican, so <laughs> I was running against the Democrat there, and uh, it, it was very close. I did not win that first time that that year, so I moved on. I opened up my own law practice and moved on with my life. I wasn't really planning to get back into politics. And then what happened is after um, the census in 2020, they redrew all the districts. So what was a purple district became a red district. Very red, very conservative area. So I got you know, the call to say you should run again because you, know, you, you ran last time, people know who you are, you did really well, so it's, it's your opportunity to run. So I ran in 2022 and that's the year I, I got elected. To, and I'm in my first term in nice. the legislature. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so that's a good thing that I did not know about, that good, good information that I did not know that it's not your first time to run. No. So A lot I, of people run, have to run more than once. And a lot of people think that if I run the first time, I don't make it, that's it, I'm out. Yeah. You know, you're telling me most people try once and twice yeah. and three times before they get elected. Yeah, I think Nixon lost many races before he won. Reagan <laughs> lost a race as well. And so what happens is a lot of time elections come down to name ID. Mm -hmm. It's just which name voters recognize on the ballot. So sometimes you have to run a few times before you have enough name ID. That's why a lot of people run, you know, for local office first, they council and then they move up because they establish they build, that name they build it's like a brand and they mm -hmm. build that name ID 
I didn't do that. I went straight for, for state assembly. I wasn't really interested in local politics. So explain to us what is the state assembly? Yeah, so state assembly is basically, it's like Congress, but for the state of California. So we have the state assembly and the state senate, and those are the two houses of the legislature, and they write all the state laws for the state of California. So any law you like or most likely don't like came from that building. So every district has an assembly member and a senate. A senate yes, member. so in California we have 80 assembly members for the whole state. So that means we each represent about a half a million people. And then there's 40 senators, so they represent a million people. So their area is twice as big as our area. Okay. So, um, and just so you know, so out of how the balance of power in Sacramento, out of the 80 assembly seats, um, 18 are Republican and 62 are Democrats. So this is what we call a, a super majority. So they, they, it's a very much a one party system up in the legislature right now. Okay. Well, that is one of the things that we uh, want to talk about because uh, there is an understanding or maybe a misconception that, uh, that if you're a Muslim, you have to go vote in a certain way or in a certain direction. Uh, we, as a nonprofit organization, whether it's the Shura Council or the Islamic Center of Your Belinda, we cannot endorse, we cannot say we are on one side or the other. So we open this platform to have people from both sides to come and talk. So we will have you from the Republican Party, we will have uh, Rivana Shashibi from the Democratic Party, and several others. And, uh, and we want to make sure that we present a balanced and fair uh, presentation about the politics in California. Mm -hmm. And today's discussion is mainly about the politics of California and how you started telling us that you said the state senate has super majority of Democrats. Is that the same as assembly? Or? Both houses. Both. Both houses have a super majority of Democrats. Okay. Now, does that mean there is no hope in your party to push or do any legislation or pass any bill? Um, so it, it's a little nuanced. It depends on what you want to do, what your goals are. Some people run for office, um, frankly, because they just want a job and they like the title. So they go up and they, they write bills that are very um, not controversial, right? Mm -hmm. Renaming a park, um, doing a, you know, you could name it, rename it. We had one member write a bill to name the California seashell. So her bill got passed. I, I didn't run for these reasons. I'm more substantive, so I want to do things that matter. So my bills don't pass because they actually change the status quo. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what kind of bills you want to write want to do up in Sacramento. So you can get some things done. Uh, my focus, the reason I ran is I think California has gone too far in one direction, to the left, especially on the, the crime side, the criminal justice stuff, which is my background. And so I, I write bills to highlight the crime issues in California, the safety issues, and to show there's a alternative and competing um, ideas for how to deal with some of these issues. So I do it more for contrast. Are, are we talking about when someone steals something, they don't get persecuted? Is that this what we're talking about? That kind of stuff. Uh, what else? Sanctuary state. Um, what does that mean? So in California, um, I'll give you a good example of a bill I wrote this year. Um, we protect people who are convicted of a crime from deportation. So we had a guy who um, raped a 12-year-old girl. He did his jail sentence. And instead of deporting him after, they put him out on the street back on the street. And that's not in every state, this situation? No, that's just California. They do not, they do not <clears throat> deport anybody and they won't hand them over to ICE for deportation. So I wrote a bill, it's very narrow, it just said, if you're convicted of a sex crime against a minor, in those cases we're going to deport you. And uh, that bill died. So I highlight these kind of issues. Um, I also oppose a lot of bills. We have a bill right now, SB 94, we're fighting in the legislature. Uh, a lot of people who committed murder with special circumstances got life without parole. So now they want to make these people eligible for parole after 25 years. So we think that's a mistake. If you've killed more than one person and the jury sentenced you to life, I don't think you should get out. So this is a big bill the Democrats are pushing right now to give these people parole opportunity to get out of prison. Like the Menendez brothers, if you remember them. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. uh, that, that sort of stuff. Now, uh, is it important for the Muslim community to be engaged with both parties? 
or should we be engaged with one party, or should we not be engaged at all? Well, I'm biased. Okay. <laughs> I, I think the Democrat Party is evil. There's no other way to say it. No, I'm, I don't say Disclaimer, this Disclaimer, that's not the opinion of the president. <laughs> when you look at their values, you look at their values and what they're doing to society, you look at, I, I'm very big on the parental rights issues. Parental rights. Parental rights. You look at what they're teaching kids in school now. Um, this gender ideology, I think, is very toxic and destructive. They're teaching kids that you're not the gender you're born in, you're the gender you want to pick. So, and there's more than two. There's like 50. I don't know. I don't know what <laughs> all 50 are. But they tell the kids, oh, there's many genders. It's not just boy or girl. So this is not a rumor. This is actual reality. You hear it on the, in, in the assembly, in the Senate. We, yeah. We've had parents whose kids have committed suicide because they were being taught these things. And it has a very damaging psychological effect on them. And the parents didn't even know this was happening in the schools. So we have parents who unfortunately have lost their kids to this. We have parents who found out and then took their kids out of the school. 100% um, it's happening. You can look up the curriculum and what they're teaching. And so um, one of the bills I introduced was that if the school is going to change the gender of the kids. So at school they'll give them, well let me just finish. They teach them all that there's many genders and then anytime a kid has a problem or they're not fitting in, they're uncomfortable, they sort of encourage them that, oh, well, maybe you're in the wrong body, this or that. So they encourage the kids to change their gender. At school, they'll let them pick a new name, new pronouns, pick different locker rooms, and then they don't tell the parents. And they say it's up to the kid if they want to have that discussion with their parents or not. We're not going to tell the parents. So when I went to school, you needed your parents' permission to watch a Disney movie. <laughs> to take an aspirin. And so now they're letting them change their gender. Um, so I wrote a bill, Assembly Bill 1314, you can look it up. It said if a child requests to change their gender, you have to inform the parents. And this was met with, I mean, you could read what they wrote about. So what, this is, was, what is the reasoning behind that? Why, why, why some state senate would say, no, that's a bad idea? The Democrats believe that that is, um, they call it outing. So they're saying, you're outing these kids. These kids are transgender. You're getting into trouble. Exactly. These kids are transgender. Their parents are going to hurt them, abuse them, evict them, everything. But, but let, <laughs> let's also, I mean, face it that the other side is a little bit more, uh, we try to create more social justice, more equality between people. Uh, does not have much racism and hatred. Mm -hmm. uh, we as a Muslim community, we kind of suffer from the bad mouthing or bad talks about us from the Republican Party. How do you manage that yourself? I, I, don't, I don't personally see that. I tell you, I, I'm, I get more racist comments and, and it's not comments from the Democrats, it's condescension. They're condescending and it's backhanded um, racism. Mm -hmm. So when I campaign, my name is Bilal, on all the mail, you know, I, I go by Bill, but all the mail against me, they put Bilal Ali Asali on the mail because they wanted to highlight to the public that I was, you know, Muslim and foreign and all this stuff. So the Democrats are not beneath it either. If it's, if the only thing they care about is winning and power, and they'll do what it takes to win. So we are not the party of racists. <coughs> We're the party of Abraham Lincoln, who was the first Republican. Republicans fought to free the slaves. We're the party of emancipation. Mm -hmm. We fought for the civil rights movement. It was the Democrats that blocked the Civil Rights Act. Democrats have a history of being racist. Look at the comments Joe Biden has made about black people and the, and the terms he used against But no one can them. hide the comments that Donald Trump was making. I mean, he's the, if you want to give the Oscar for a racist president. What did he say? Oh, every, I mean, you tell me. <laughs> I don't. That's, I, I, I have not heard Donald Trump make any racist comments directly. When I think what happens well, is the media... When he said, see, that's not appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me the comment. I haven't heard it. I mean, if you said, for example, we're not going to allow Muslims to enter the that's, country. Okay, that's not a comment, and that's not what he said. Uh -huh. What they did is, there was a list of countries where we can't verify people's identity from. Mm. Because the country doesn't have enough systems in place. But, security in place, hold on. This was during ISIS and all this stuff going on. Countries like Syria, where you, you, there was no system in place to confirm people's identity. So it wasn't about Muslim countries. It was about countries where you couldn't verify people's identity. They were worried about 
letting someone in who might be See, a but, but these kind of comments that the, the person who's ignorant, I'll, I'll tell you a personal story that happened with me. The day Donald Trump got on the podium and he said, we're not going to allow what we understood Muslims to enter the country, and they call it the Muslim ban. Even the media it's a called the media called it yeah, the Muslim even those ban. Called, it's it's a a Trump didn't call it the Muslim ban. But the next day, <laughs> someone pulls a knife on my wife and tells her, "I don't trust you. I want you out of this country." Mm -hmm. and so you can see how these kinds of words could get into someone who's ignorant or someone who's. How do you know they were Republican? <laughs> we, we don't know. I mean, exactly. Be, yeah. There yeah. are racist people, absolutely. But so you strongly believe that Muslims should be engaged with the Republican Party? If you, if, if you as a Muslim have values and principles, um, traditional values and principles, I don't understand how you support a party that all they do every day up in Sacramento, they push bills to promote abortion. They, they, they don't, no limits on abortion. They want to rip the kids out of the, the pregnant women's body, no questions asked. They want to destroy... Um, you know, the, 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 this gender business, they want to destroy the kids' um, perceptions of gender, traditional gender roles, male and female. I mean, they're destroying the family unit. Um, they're unleashing crime onto the street. They've unleashed half the prisoners in our state prison. We had 180 prisoners. We have, we have 90,000 prisoners now. I had a woman in my district in Walmart. She was working. She's 60 years old. Some guy just got out of prison on parole. He felt like, you know, he didn't like being out. He wanted to go back to prison. He got a knife and stabbed her and killed her because he wanted to go back to prison. So I, I have a hard time understanding how anyone supports these policies. I don't understand it. A lot of it is what you said. The media characterizes one party as racist and bigoted and the Democrats as your saviors. I, said, I hope people will start doing their own independent thinking and assessments and judge not by words, but by actions. You want to talk about Donald Trump. One thing Donald Trump did not do is start a war in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I remember this very clearly. Every president, and by the way, it's not so much about the president, it's about the system, the American system and the military industrial complex loves war because they make a lot of money off of it. Okay, Both sides, Democrat, Republican. Trump was the first president who resisted starting a war, and they wanted him to. Um, he pulled out of Syria. He did not start a war with Iran, even though they wanted him to. He, he ended the, the whole ISIS thing, went away, <laughs> in like a few months. And if you remember, his first um, defense secretary, Mad Dog Mattis, you guys remember this guy? Um, he resigned. Why did he resign? He resigned because Trump pulled the troops out of Syria. He said, if you pull those troops out, I'm going to quit. He said, goodbye. So I look more at people's actions than, than, than the words and what they say. And um, we had war under Obama. We had war under Bush. Um, war under Joe Biden. You, I mean, you could see the result of this administration, this policy. Just turn on the TV. So that's how I look at the world. I... I, I, I I'm very skeptical of what the media says and brands people because they have an agenda, and I judge people more on their, their actions. Now, do I support everything Trump does? No. Is he perfect? No. But we're a two-party system, and so you've got to make a decision between one or the two. And then getting back to your point, engaging in the party and shaping it and, and, and influencing it. I mean, the last 10 months, which was very, very difficult to the Muslim community, oh, absolutely. what was happening in Gaza. And we see how both Republicans and Democrats, they race and they compete in condemning Palestinians and praising Israel and supporting it and all that. Um, and many people said, you know what, forget it. I don't want to vote. I don't want to be part of this system. Both sides are bad to us. What do you tell someone who decides not to vote mm -hmm. in November because of that? And if you can also elude on the point that you just finished is that there's a, you can change something if you're not happy with it. Absolutely. So you have to be involved because if you don't, if you're not involved, then then you've given up. You've given your power away, right? And. I do think you have a responsibility as a citizen to be engaged in your government. Otherwise, you're letting other people make those decisions. So I don't like when people, you know, everything doesn't go their way, so they want to take their ball and go home. This is childish to me. 
And I, so, <laughs> you know. We have that in, in, in our organizations, yeah. in our message. If someone, well, Maisha should be at 9.15, why it's 9.17? I know I'm not coming back to pray. <laughs> we'll have some people, just people that way, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not healthy for our community. And what, what's happened is the people who are obsessed with all the wrong people, who are obsessed with power and, no, and making sick. decisions, they, they lean in harder. And they, they then become in control. They don't, they don't leave easily. No. They, they stick around. You're right. They double down. And if they lose, they go again. They try again. They push the agenda again. And our side just is like, and when I say our side, I feel like normal people. Oh my God, this politics, it's so crazy. Too much drama. It's a headache. I don't want anything to do with it. I just want to raise my kids, go to school, go to work. You know, I have enough problems. You know, my mom watches all these soap operas. So she's like, <laughs> she's like, she loves she loves all these problems. I'm like, but um, so what I would say is, um, you can influence the party. So there's kind of a civil war in the Republican Party between what I would say are the neocons. If you don't know, neoconservatives are the Republicans who love war, right? No, no, no limit on how much money we spend on war, no limit where we go, just war, 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 okay? You could see, like, Lindsey Graham, you know, wants to go to war with everybody, right? Uh, under George Bush and Dick Cheney, you'd call him a neocon. Versus the, the Trump wing, or MAGA, whatever you want to call it, they don't like war. Trump, Trump was against the Iraq war. He thought we shouldn't go there. And he doesn't want to spend money on it, and he doesn't want to send people there to die. So... You have this fight within the Republican Party on should we be funding Ukraine? Should we be perpetuating all these wars? Or should we you know, spend that money on our own citizens? So there's an important battle going on inside the Republican Party. And you know, if you're not part of that, then you're not able to influence that, that decision. Okay. Um, when you decided to run as a Republican, I mean, you always been a Republican. You didn't just decide, okay, let me, right? I mean, I think as a as a kid growing up, I was like, oh, maybe I'm a Democrat and I'm independent. And then I would say when when Arnold ran for governor, I sort of then I think that's when I decided I was a Republican because I liked his movies. Uh, I, li I liked what he was running for. <laughs> he does have good movies, but I liked the idea. I mean. When, when I had my campaign office, I had a lot of interns and kids, and I, I talked to the high school kids and I let them ask me questions. The question I get all the time is, what's the difference between a Republican and a Democrat? And it's such a simple question, but it's such a good question. And I think the main difference is about who is better equipped to decide what's best for you, the government or you, the individual. And so Republicans think you should make the decisions for your life, for your family, What's best for you? You should keep most of your money, decide how to spend your money, take care, of, take care of other people, charity, whatever. Democrats believe that you don't know as much as they do, and the government should make these decisions. Give all your money to the government, and they'll take care of you. They'll give you health care. They'll give you free tuition. They'll give you this. Nothing's free. But, uh, you know, it's this, this question about who should, who should be dictating or deciding um, you know, these main decisions for our lives, the government or the individual. This is a big fight philosophically. So I tend to think that individuals should be responsible and make their, make their own decisions. That means some people will fail and some will succeed, but that's, I think, the best system. So as, as you all notice that we are letting everyone defend their positions like we did with other guests who represented the Democratic Party and we told them to just speak up. And I try to play the, the other side's advocate, trying to throw questions at you uh, that mm, to give you, to, to answer, to answer those questions. So thank you for answering those questions. And whether my questions today or my questions with other guests, they don't represent my position. I'm just here to get the, the conversation going and the dialogue going. Absolutely. Uh, so when you ran as a Republican, and uh, how did the Muslim community deal with that? Well, I mean, they're not a, Muslims aren't a monolith, so it wasn't like one one response. I would say, how did the Muslim activists deal? With oh that? no, they were against me. <laughs> okay. Because the majority of Muslim activists care side, right? care all these groups. Let's not mention names. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I mean, you're asking says, me. Okay. So I think sometimes they let that cloud their, their judgment. And I tell the care people directly. It's not secret. I mean, they're nice people, but I disagree with them. So in my race, 
they endorsed an atheist over the Muslim. Okay, they endorsed her over me. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't really have much to say about that. I I I think we've allowed the left to put Muslims in a box, and and this is what the left, in my opinion, likes to do. They like to get groups and put them in a box. They do this to African Americans. They do it to Muslims, and they say we're going to protect you. We'll take care of you. Just just vote for us. But what do they? They do nothing. They don't do anything for them. So we had a bill in the legislature this year, MENA, the MENA bill, Middle Eastern North African bill. Um, when you put your race right now in government forms, there's no box for us, right? You can put white, you can put other, that's it. So we tried to do a bill to um, include a box for Middle Eastern North Africans, and the, the, they killed it. They didn't want to. They didn't want to pay for it. Okay. So they want your vote, but then they don't want to give you anything or prioritize you. So. Okay. Okay, so uh, we've seen waves of people moving out of California. Yes. Where they're Muslims and non-Muslims, they're moving. A lot of the Christian communities go into cities where they can practice their faith better, like uh, Idaho, uh, Arizona, <laughs> Texas. And a lot of people are leaving, not just because of their family values, but also for financial reasons. Yes. High taxation and more uh, employers uh, rights or friendly states for employers and businesses and uh, what, what do you think of that? What do you think of when, when people say that? What do you think? Well, I think in, in our system of government, the United States, our founding fathers set it up so that way people could vote with their feet. So the states were supposed to be different experiments, 50 different experiments going on at the same time. And people would, would move depending on which states we're serving them better or not. So when people move, it's an indication that something's not going right here. This mm -hmm. is not, this isn't going well. The government isn't, isn't functioning well. We're getting out. We're going to go to Florida, Arizona, Nevada, wherever. So it means the government's failing. So who's been running the government in California? Arnold left in 2010. He's the last Republican that had any say or any power. So Democrats have been running it for 24, 25 years with no single Republican. But you ask them who's to blame, and they say Trump <laughs> for everything. So to me, when you see people leave, it means the government's failing. The policies are hostile to individuals. They're hostile to, com to companies. We pay the highest taxes in any state, and what do we get? You get a toll road. You can pay $20 if you don't want to sit in traffic. You get a registration for your car, $600. If you're if you're lucky, every year, and then it's it's the should schools be less, you're saying? should be way less six hundred dollars for for oh, a sticker, <laughs> on top of the income tax, on top of all the sales tax, property tax, everything. We pay the highest taxes, and we get the least in return. We spend more money on schools than any other state, and the kids are not learning. The kids, math, English, reading, down. So gender we'll, gender ideology, they know all about it, but they don't know how to read. This is, this so is what's California. an example of a state that's more on the right and is doing better in schools? Uh, I think Florida is doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, you got Texas. You got, I'd say Texas and Florida is where a lot of people are moving to. Um, what's interesting on the schools, I'm hearing a lot more from parents now. They're doing virtual learning. They're doing homeschooling, private school. So yeah. I think there's a lot of parents who are, if they can. So that's one of the things that I, when, when I went and spoke to several school districts about what's happening in the schools, and this is my warning was to them, is like you're gonna see an exodus of many families taking their kids out of the public school system. As you into should. Private school, charter schools, homeschooling, because they're not okay with what's happening in the school system, okay. Um, I have several more questions, but I'd like to see if any of you would like to ask. Uh, on the school thing, real quick, one, one of the policies we push a lot for is called the school voucher system. I don't know if you're familiar with it. So there's money attached to each student, like 15000 a year. It might be more than that now to each student that the school district gets for your child. So one of the proposals the Republicans have is to give you that money, so give you a check every year for the 15000 to use either to the public school or you could take it and use it at a private school. That would be nice. That is a, <laughs> some states have it, it's very successful. They will never do it in California because the teachers union is so powerful. Mm -hmm. They fund all the Democrat elections in Sacramento. If they, people take their kids out of school, that's less money for the school and that's less teacher jobs. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we could have a longer conversation, but that's one small 
solution that we would have. Going back to my point, Republicans want to put that money back into your hands so you could decide where to send it. So before I open it to the floor for questions, yeah. give us a quick uh, explanation of the process of a, a law, yeah. how it becomes a law, a bill, how, what, what, what the, how does it start and how does it end? So you need a lawmaker, so like me, either an assemblyman or a senator, they uh -huh. write a law. Together or se separate? Separate. Doesn't matter. Everyone on their own, you can write your own bill. Uh -huh. So first it's a bill, you can write it however you want. So like with the MENA bill, we, I, my office wrote that bill, we worked with, uh, with some community groups on the language. Then you introduce it, then it gets assigned to a committee. So if I wrote a, a bill about public safety, it goes to the public safety committee, okay? So it goes to a committee which is like a subgroup of the legislature. It has to pass the committee first. If it passes the committee, then it goes to the full assembly and it has to get 41 votes, a majority. Then it goes to the Senate and it starts all over again. Committee, floor vote. So if it passes the Senate and the Assembly, then it goes to the governor and he can either sign it or veto it. But that's the, that's the so quick process. So when you said they killed it, that means they did not even pass the committee? Uh, it, it means it, yeah, it, it passed a policy committee and they killed it in a, in, no, there were two committees. Uh -huh. It passed one committee and then it died in the second committee. Got it, yeah. all right. Questions? I mean, interesting, right? Yes. Maybe uh, <laughs> not, not quite often you hear that side of the story. Go ahead. Uh, I know you talked a lot about you know, uh, Democrats being too far left. Mm -hmm. I want to touch on uh, if the Republicans are going too far right. Well, Republicans in California aren't going anywhere because we have no problem. <laughs> We're talking about Republicans, right? Yeah. I think any time... Um, any time that you have... Uh, just, just a question. I'm going to repeat the question okay. for the camera, okay? Uh, the question was, you said that the Democrats are going too left, but what about the Republicans going too right? Yeah. I, that question to me, it, there's no such thing as too right, because if you look at what the Republicans want, they want to preserve the status quo. They want to reserve the, the Constitution and the government as it was intended. So... I don't, I mean, we're not trying to accumulate more power and do more things. We're trying to do less things and roll back the policies. Um, one of the things that Trump said he wants to do if elected is get rid of the federal Department of Education. Save all that money, send it to the states. I mean, why is the federal government involved in, in public education? We're not, you know. So they want to get less government out of your lives. Um, now, there are some states where they have a supermajority on the Republican side, and I think that's a bad thing, too. I think any time you have supermajorities, it's not good. You want there to be some check, check and, balance. and balance, so that way if they go too far on an issue, then there's someone there to sort of pull them back a little bit and say, no, that's too much, let's bring it in. Um, California, to break the supermajority, we would need to win nine seats. And what that would allow us to do is um, they need two-thirds to pass a tax increase or to do a constitutional amendment. So if we broke the supermajority, we could stop them from raising taxes, for example. That's something we'd be able to do. But, I mean, if you have, a, you have something in mind about where Republicans have gone too far? No, I, I just feel that there's no mediocrity anymore. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, there, there's Republicans are going one way and Democrats are going the other way. The gender, gender uh, thing in schools is, I mean, completely off the off the balance, but not giving women uh, abortion rights, I think, you know, that should be a personal choice, right? Mm -hmm. But that goes by state by state, it doesn't go by uh, Republicans, but that's the way the Republicans <coughs> Yeah, I think most Republican laws in that, I don't think there's any states where they've outlawed abortion completely, but some states say after so many weeks, 12 weeks, 13 weeks, that's when they say that's too late, you know, so, um, but, I mean, in California, that's, that's not an issue, so, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, you had your hand up? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. You're welcome. We appreciate your uh, input. I'm just kind of baffled by the fact the way you command, you know, I commend you for defending Donald Trump's words when he came in and said the Muslim bans, loud and clear. There was no ambiguity about that whatsoever. Now I understand the security reasons whatsoever, you know, and what have you. Uh, there could be a lot of different ways that policy could have been handled, first of all. He doesn't have to come in and say A, B, C, D, seven Muslim countries are not allowed to come in. 
Anyway, second thing, you said something in the fact that uh, he didn't start any wars. Well, he didn't have to start any wars at all. He just went to the top of the uh, you know, hills in uh, Gaza or Palestine and said, you know, um, and the ground standing on his side and said, oh, yeah, this piece of land is yours. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem is recognized as a, your, you know, capital. He didn't ask anybody. We didn't, you know, I have wanted both sides. I have wanted from Carter to Reagan, Bill Clinton to uh, Bush. Now, Bush is the one who was a Republican. He said Republicans are not in for a fight, but Republicans are the ones that started fight. Neocons Neo 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 was one of the groups. Yeah. You know, Dick Cheney was known. When Bush picked the Dick, Dick Cheney and the, uh, I forget the name of the uh, defense minister. Rumsfeld or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knew about it. There was so, no... Do, I mean, do you have a question? No, no, nobody had. Now, tell me something that when we look at the Democrats or Republicans, where does the Muslim community stand? I mean, who do you think, in your opinion, since you are a Republican, that there is a room for Muslim community to be part of that and go forward? I, I really believe it's the Republican Party, because especially with Donald Trump. I mean, you look at his daughter, Tiffany Trump. Her husband is Lebanese. And so... Yeah, but no, her, no, no, Tiffany what Trump. What does that mean? What does that mean? Tiffany. Oh, Tiffany Trump, not, not, not Ivanka. <laughs> I'm just saying, hold on, let me finish. Tiffany Trump. What's the first country Trump visited after he got elected? Saudi Arabia. For a very first Once country. all of them go there for Hajj. Obama did that. He went to the very first country. He didn't go to Israel. He went to Saudi Arabia. Um, I do remember when he moved the embassy, and do you remember what he said to Palestine at the time he moved the embassy? Yeah, but what he Hold said... Hold on, do you remember what he said to... What, he said. what did he say to Palestine? What did he say to Palestine when he moved the embassy? He said, if you make a peace deal, I'll put your embassy in Jerusalem as well. Yeah, but how was So he, it, he was... He was being very clear. He want like... I mean, the Palestine thing, we have a long conversation, but... There has to be a peace deal. I think so. You're not going to resolve this conflict with a war. I mean, we all believe way. that. There has to be a peace deal. So he said, if you want to come to the table and have a peace deal, I will put the Palestine embassy in Jerusalem as well. It's not exclusive for one side or the other. He also did the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords, uh, you know, with, with... So within the Muslim community, there's a lot of skepticism about the Abraham Accords. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, major concerns about the, the accord itself and the things that are happening. So when, if you go and say, uh, and say uh, this is something that we thank Trump for doing it, you're going to see a lot of... Uh, well, to me, it's indication that he, he wants to make, he wants to find a way to find peace and do deals. So he's not out funding wars, he's out trying to put... Uh, look, Trump, he's not ideological, okay? He's not... I don't think he, he thinks of things like in a religious way or a uh, or, or like he's got like this this agenda. He's a deal maker. He's a business guy, and I think he's a deal maker. So for me, I can work with someone who who wants to do a deal, okay? Because he's not driven by some other radical ideology. What what do you have the, the Democrat Party? What you have Biden and Kamala? What are, what are they doing? I mean, they so, they've perpetuated this war for the last yeah. almost a year now. No solution. They're funding. They give Israel everything they want. So, what, so why, why is that alternative better? I think at least with Trump, you have a chance. You, you to, see, the, you saw the movement within the community. Oh yeah. Where uh, the the rejection to support uh, Joe Biden and the name, the nickname that was given to him, genocide Joe. Uh, that that's clear. That's clear with it. But you will see that majority of the Muslim community uh, who are really upset with Biden, who used to be a voter for him. They're, they're saying we're not going to vote him, but they're not going to. They don't say we're going to vote to the other side. Mm. They say we're going to abstain or we're going to vote, vote third party. And that's a question. Last week we answered it, or last month we answered it in the in the in the last session. Go ahead, sister. You have a question? Oh, uh, yes. assalamu alaikum. Um, just to inject a little. You're kind of offense, but you're kind of going against your own words. Didn't you just say a couple minutes ago that um, I don't look at words, I look at actions? Yes. And so when you just said a little, like, you know, when answering his question, you stated that, um, you know, look what Trump said. But see, that's what I was saying. 
he, you know, you could talk the talk, but not everybody could walk the walk. So Trump is, he will say whatever it takes, just like pretty much any other politician in the world, will say whatever it takes to get the vote, but once you get it, then it's kind of like, it's like the thrill of the chase. You get, get what you want and then you forget. But, you know, that being said, um, I want to add something to that, if you don't mind. Um, I, you know, being a woman and a mother of two, alhamdulillah, I would never, ever, like not even in my wildest dream, think about, you know, voting for a man. It doesn't matter, you know, what his um, you know, religion or his, you know, concepts of ideas or whatever it is or what politics or what have you. Somebody that treats a woman, especially a person that came out of a woman, you know, with the vile things that he says about us. I mean, I'm sorry with all due respect. I, I can do you have an example? No, 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 no. We don't want to change this to become a, a, to a Trump defense uh, session. We are talking about California politics and how we can <laughs> engage in both sides. And is it is it possible that we be engaged with both sides? So that's what we want the discussion to be, inshallah. So we got your point. Very, very valid. Point. So, so vote, so vote, vote for a woman. Hold on. So vote for a woman who had an affair with Willie Brown to start her political career. She ruined a family to start her own political career. So if that's who you prefer to vote for, that's fine. I'm just saying I'm not in the moral. I'm not in the moral business. So no, 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 no. I'm not in the moral. We're not electing a moral. But my question to you was: Yes. How not only you know how does any person stand behind a person like that and say, well, you know, this is the man I want to vote for? So so let me. I I will tell you something about how we talked about it last time. We talked about it. We need to start thinking what makes more sense when it comes to who's in charge or who's elected. Not just thinking about, yes, I personally, last elections, I did not vote to neither. I did not vote to Joe Biden or Trump. I went third party because I believe this side is fully supportive of Israel and this side said so many bad things about Muslims. Mm -hmm. That's how I voted for the president. Forget about the top line. Now we're talking about the rest of the positions, the school boards, the local yeah. city councils, the local congressmen or congresswomen, the, uh, the, the uh, judges. There's so many other things that we need to look at. And in my opinion, especially this coming election, don't base all your voting based on, on the president position. Either you completely take it out or vote something else, right? Or vote where I don't endorse again. No endorsement from the masjid. Or, I think that's a really good point. When I ran the first time, it was 2018, so it was two years after Trump, when I would go talk to people at their door about California, they don't want to talk about California. They said, do you support Trump? That's yeah. all they want to know. Yeah. And that's how they were going to vote. And I go, but Trump has nothing to do with California. I mean, we have all these issues here, schools, this, that. They don't, just Trump. So I think the media has done a good job of making people have an emotional reaction to candidates, like Trump or Biden, whoever. And... It helps, in my opinion, it helps the Democrats because if, if you're so emotionally, if you have an emotional reaction to Trump, then it doesn't matter what any Republican says or does, you're not going to vote for them because it's a, it's a referendum on, on Trump. And, and to be fair, it's the same applies both sides. I mean, I'm trying that to, yeah. to uh, because in, in the other guests, we allow them to speak up sure. whatever they want to say. And we're trying to do the same here, to be fair. I'm glad you mentioned the things that you mentioned. I'm glad you were clear and open and transparent in how you think. Well, this gives us a different perspective. Sure. Because the, the Muslim community need to start looking at all sides, need to start dealing with all sides, because at some point, one of them is going to be in charge, right? This four years, this some, the other next four years, the other side. And we need to learn from other communities. Other communities, like for example, the American Jewish community, 30% of them vote one side, 70% vote for the other side. When one is in charge, look, we supported you. When this is in charge, look, we supported you. This is something we as a Muslim community need to start learning how to do politics and, 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 and strategize based on that. Uh, we talked last time about voting blocks. We talked about diversity, which, which one's better, inshallah. You can go back to that episode and listen to uh, some of the experts, what did they say about uh, how to vote as a block or have the different uh, opinion, uh, diverse uh, positions in the community. But today, we're talking about and celebrating uh, a, a first uh, Muslim to be elected to the assembly member. 
yes, <laughs> absolutely. And we will disagree with you on certain things, That's just fine. like we disagree with any politicians. It's a free country. <laughs> and we would like you to listen, right? That This is one of the things that we'd like to happen here. And I think it's good for you to hear what your, your faith community. I know you don't run as a, as a, as a, as a representative of the Muslim community, right? You represent right. your own Congress, this, uh, your own district, right? So we want you to hear from the Muslim community yeah. their concerns, their thoughts, like you heard today. And I hope that, because you are oh, so you know, it doesn't affect your <laughs> uh, But take that, and when these discussions take place, say, hey, just want to let you know that if you want the Muslim vote, this is their concerns. Mm -hmm. This is how they don't like things that was said. We want you to let them hear us, what we said today, and what others could give you feedback later on to hopefully influence some of the, the positions and the words and the, and the addresses. I have to be honest with you, no one talks about the Muslim vote because they haven't established themselves as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a power in politics. Now, I think what happened in Michigan is a big deal. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I saw Muslims say, we're not voting for Democrats anymore. And they actually, they got scared. Right? Absolutely. The Democrat party, they got scared, they got listened. I, I, so, I think, like, that's why, what I'm saying, I'm not telling you, you know, vote for Trump or this or that, but don't give blind allegiance to one party. Yes. Make them work for your vote. And like I said, you're not going to like both, you're not going to like things from both parties, but, um, but make a practical decision of which you think is going to be best for, for, for the community, yourself, your family. So, you know, I look at things like APAC. APAC is very good at supporting both sides. That's what we're saying. They don't care who wins, Republican or Democrat, because they've, in, they've entrenched themselves, they've established themselves that they're going to get support from either side, right? So that's why I think it's a mistake for, for Muslims to just One be side. Democrats, because then they take you for granted. They don't talk about you. They're not worried about losing your vote. Um, so, so what happened in Michigan, I yeah. remember in the beginning of what's happening in Gaza, we had several meetings with Congress members, and they were so annoyingly dismissive for our concerns. After what happened in Michigan, people start, Congress members start calling us, let's meet, let's talk, what's your concern, what can we do for you? That made a big difference. And why, why did it make a, it made a difference? Because Michigan is a swing state. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kamala can't win without Michigan. So all of a sudden now they care. Right. Absolutely. So withhold your power. You know, I don't. I don't believe in third parties. It just. It doesn't work in America. We're a two-party system. Um, we don't have a parliament where you can put different parties together to create a, a governing coalition. We are two parties. So, I, I think if you vote third party, you're kind of throwing your vote away. Um, I, I think you should be willing to cross party lines more often, okay. and then that will, and also organizing better. Um, I know we have Muslim Day at the Capitol, so making that bigger, more, more meaningful. And I have to be honest with you, I mean, like, APAC's very good at, at raising money and fundraising, so that's another thing that I don't see the Muslim community do much no, of, to be you. honest with you. <laughs> we we uh, do it like we invite them to our house, we give them a check, we take a picture, yeah. and that's it. But we definitely, I think we can go home with these three things. Do not have blind allegiance to any party. Go vote for those who are willing to serve you and listen to your voices. Number two, be engaged. Don't say, I'm not going to get involved, I'm not going to vote. Be engaged because that makes a difference. And number three, we need to also use our financial power to make a difference. So uh, we are very, we were very honored yeah, to have this you. This was us. fun. And hopefully we'll have you again in the same time. We wish you all the best in the coming elections. Thank you. And this is your masjid. Anytime you like to come, you're more than welcome to visit. Right.